My name is Brian Young. I'm an instructional designer with Education Technology Services, and uh, I worked with Jennifer last last semester, right? Last, oh my God, it's been yeah, last <laughs> semester. Last semester. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about how that worked out um, as far as clickers go, and then um, Jennifer's probably going to talk more about her her initial reaction when we met and uh, how just utterly terrified she was, and how that. Being terrified changed a little bit within the first couple of weeks of the semester, so yourself okay. a better job. So um, I'm Jennifer Couplin and I'm a faculty member in the marketing department. And I teach a wide variety of courses, ranging from the very large, so our principles of marketing course, which is taught in the forum. So there are 300 or 350 students in that sort of, you know, um, in that type of classroom. Then I teach smaller classes, so our electives, um, I teach an advertising course, which is project-based, it's about 40 students, which I haven't used the clickers in yet, but I'm thinking about transitioning to that once the students have all purchased clickers, um, since my classes are all seniors, and it's mostly sophomores at the moment that seem to have clickers, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sophomores, well, some juniors, now, so. and, so, and freshmen, yeah, all of them. Um, so that, will, that transition will probably happen, and then I teach quite small classes, like our honors seminar in marketing, so you know, that can be 15 to 20 students, but I'm also toying with the idea of using clickers in that situation as well. Um, but my, most of my experience has been in these very large class sizes, so 300 students, sometimes 150, and that sort of thing. I'm first curious about the audience. Um, do some of you teach larger courses, like, you know, 80 students and above? Some of you, okay, so some of you may find this directly relevant. And so you teach smaller courses, so you're trying to see whether it's relevant, okay. I'm trying to figure that out as well, too, and I'm, I'm going to pilot it um, in a, a couple of the last sessions in my 40-person class um, this semester, and I think it's going to work out really well, because even when you have classes where there's a lot of discussion already, you find that you break down a lot of barriers by taking polls and asking factual questions and seeing whether people really get the material, um, even as, in a smaller class size. So it's a little bit of an introduction, but I think Brian has some questions for me, and we were just going to yeah. chat a little bit. Well, I, I guess I have some questions for you guys first. Why here and not the keynote speech uh, follow up? Uh, why here and not across the hall? So what are you guys doing here in the clicker session? And I can wait. So if you just, nobody wants to answer, we can sit quietly. <laughs> Brad is assisting uh, uh, one of the 40 person uh, classes uh -huh. next semester in the fall. So yeah. we want to see if the clicker is something that can be useful. What class? Okay, good. Uh, sports Media and Society. Oh, cool. Great, great. I'm from Grand State Viewer. We just bought uh -huh. the technology, and it's in the uh -huh. boxes now. We want to learn. It's in the boxes. I was there for a long time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Good. Okay, so I use uh, clickers in the large lecture class, and I'm curious to see how you use it. Okay, so you've already started I've been using it. Okay, so I know a couple of you have, have tried it out and are sort of working with it and everything, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you guys. So I guess the first question I'm gonna ask you, Jennifer, and I'm gonna sit down because okay. it feels, I feel like I'm interrogating you. <laughs> I don't know if this might be worse, right? So um, we, the first time we met was um, maybe about a month or so before the semester started. And, uh, and I remember you being very hesitant yeah. at first. Yeah. And uh, I guess, I, I think there's a lot of people that are there, yeah. right? There, I mean, I would be too. Yeah. Um, How many of you feel really hesitant to try out clickers for whatever reason? Okay, so some of you are, some of you are, seem more open-minded, which is really great. I was terrified. I mean, we called the session from fear to joy. Um, I am a technophobe. I am not an innovator. I've been teaching um, at Penn State for 14 years. I never used clickers. Um, I was teaching this really large intro class for five years. I was doing fine. You know, my SRTEs were fine. There was no reason I felt I had to innovate. But we were kind of set up with a session with Brian, um, a couple of us who were teaching the core classes, by some of the um, people who were kind of interested in exploring this opportunity. And I went into the session just thinking, there is no way I'm going to do this. I know these clickers are in the boxes, you know, I just, it's going to mess up my class, I'm going to have to prepare new material, you know, all this stuff. But after about half an hour of chatting with, with Brian and seeing how the technology works, I was totally converted. I thought, 
you know what, I will try this. It seems really easy to use. I know they had some issues with a previous clicker system, but this new system is really straightforward for people who know nothing about technology. Um, and I just suddenly thought, there are so many things I can do with my class now that I couldn't do before. And so I thought, well, I'm willing to kind of try it. You know, because if you're in a large lecture in particular, you don't know if the students are really with you. I mean, you can show them a sample exam question, and you can sort of say, who knows the answer, right? And then you can kind of talk about the answer, but you don't really know what percentage of the students actually know the answer, right? Um, our college is also really into activity-based learning, which if you're in a class of 300 students, trying to run activities is really hard. We would pass out index cards, we would hand out scantrons, right? We did all this, which was very paper intensive. And I started thinking, well, you know what? The clickers collect all this information automatically. It is automatically put into the software, so you know who was answered. So, you know, I'll just try it. Um, and so after meeting Brian, and he actually sat down with me, we worked through questions and things like that. It didn't actually take all that much time to change some of the things in my course, to add a few questions. Um, this clicker system is not tied to PowerPoint. Like you can at the last minute say, you know what, I want to ask them this question today. I just thought of that. So tell me if A, if you say yes, B, if you say no. You know, so there was a lot that I thought was kind of low risk. Now, if you're teaching 545 students in a semester, it's a risk, right? But I kind of thought, okay, he was very reassuring. <laughs> so I'll try it out. So some of my fears were sort of dissipated. And I went into the classroom the first day and it worked. So, so there was some of that, yeah. So typically, and I, so in my role, I get, to, I get to meet with every instructor on campus that uses clickers or was thinking about using clickers or any of that stuff. Um, typically what I see happening is the first semester that instructors are, are doing this from the start, they will do a lot of just, here's a question, B is the correct answer, and they will stick mm -hmm. with that. And you did not which yeah. was like you were way ahead yeah. of the curve on that and it was it was exciting for me because you did some really great question types and engaging questions that I think you can you can speak more to um, whenever you want. So, so part I mean part of what I learned in watching the online sort of information I went to YouTube and watched how people actually use clickers I talked with Brian some more and so I learned a number of things um, first when you use clickers you have to give a lot of leverage for students getting questions wrong. Because otherwise, you're dealing with a lot of nitpicky, but I clicked in and I just didn't click in before you cut the time on it. Or my battery died halfway through the session, right? So you give them a lot of leverage. So I don't actually count if questions are correct or incorrect. I only count if they click in. So you give them a lot of leverage on that. That also buys me the opportunity to ask a variety of kinds of questions. First, you can ask factual questions in which, yes, they should get it right. But, you know, our students are very full of, like, pride, and so they want to be right, right, when they, ask, when they answer a question. Um, and so, you know, you can ask kind of the factual questions, and you can get at that. But I also find it's very useful to ask them questions for which there is no obvious correct answer, right? And that's why not tying it to being right or not doesn't matter. Right? So I might ask them, I can show you some examples you know, in a moment, you know, I might ask them like a, a, a case question in which there are three different options. It's a little bit debatable what is the right answer. Okay? So you could talk with them about that. You can ask them opinion-based questions that might then engage them and make them a little more interested in the material. Should I just show them some of yeah. these examples? Okay, so, um, so what I did was I just pulled a, a few sort of examples of things. So um, what you can look at are sort of before clickers, what did I do, and what happened post clickers. So before clickers, I would ask a sample exam question. It doesn't actually matter what it says on here, okay? A lot of you have multiple choice questions and that sort of thing. So I do a review session or I will review homework, and what I used to do was I would just show them the question and I would say to the student, you know, 300 people, or you could easily do this in 30, right, class of 30 people, say, um, okay, so let's look at these responses, and what do you think is the correct answer, okay? Now, when you're standing there, it's gonna take a while for anybody to be brave enough to, to raise their hand and be confident to know the answer, right? Having taught this class for five years, I know that when you give people like this, they feel really unsure about it. Well, I used to then say, okay, let's reduce the risk and say you can chat with your neighbor, right? Chat with your neighbor and then let me know what the answer is. That's a little better, but you know what? When people don't know what the answer is, for sure, they're embarrassed to raise their hand, right? 
So I felt like I needed ways to kind of break down the ball. So I would just do that, and then, you know, I'd kind of, you know, maybe get somebody to answer the question. I'd say, D is the correct answer, and here's why, and we talk about it. Okay? So it's sort of, you know, interesting. It's, it's a little bit more passive. Using clickers, however, you know, you can ask them the sample exam question, and then very, in a very straightforward manner, just turn it into a clicker, clicker question. Pull out your clicker and just key in what is the correct answer. And oftentimes, what I will do is I will show what the class said before I ask people to give me an explanation. So I'll say, well, it looks like 73% of the class think it's D. Um, and D, in fact, is the correct answer. So here I can see, I can gauge how easy or difficult this question is. I can see whether people are getting it. I mean, if I get 73% of the people saying it's A, or something, you know, then I know there's something wrong with the question or something wrong with something I talked about in class where they were misled or something like that. So I say, okay, well, it looks like 73% of the people think it's D. Let's talk about why, right? So then you have people who said D who are much more confident. So they're going to raise their hand and tell you why. Because I know that's the right answer, and I know that a lot of people thought it was the right answer. You could even not show them the answer, right, and say 73% of you said that. Um, you can even, depending on the circumstances, say, but you know what, 12% of the people said A. Um, why do you think 12% of the people said A? Right? We know that's not the right answer, but anybody can then raise their hand and say whether or not they were the person who said A, they can say, well, you know, 24 people said that because they were thinking about some other concept. Right? So what you're doing is you're providing just way more confidence in interacting in the class. And you're providing way more engagement, right, in the class and the content of the material. It's less passive. It's much more uh, active. So that's kind of a straightforward way of doing questioning, where you already have some sort of multiple choice set up. Um, another example would be something like, um, uh, I'm lecturing, OK? Uh, I'm talking about experimental research, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, let's talk about this idea of test market selection. In the past, I would say, well, when you select a test market, there are different characteristics you want to take into account. Let me show you a list of the best and the worst test markets. So on here will be a list of cities, right? The, the best and the worst. And, you know, for the first five years, I would kind of say, okay, here's the list. I would show them a list of the cities, and I'd say, what do you think is happening here? What do you think makes a good test market versus a bad test market? And hopefully, we would get some discussion around it, okay? But I'm never certain that you're getting full student engagement in something like that, right? Because just a couple people are raising their hand in, in the audience. So you can use um, clickers instead, sort of do the same lecture material, and then instead ask a clicker question that is kind of relevant. Right? So Brian helped me with this one. Which city is considered the best market in which to test new advertising campaigns and new products? Right, so turn it into a question that's addressing the same content material, but in a way that gets into the same thing. Does anybody, what would you click in when we ask you that? If you were given an anonymous, nobody knows what you've answered, right? What, do you, what would you click in? B. B. You'd click in B, yeah. Anybody click in A? Okay, so, so this is interesting, right? So we've got kind of a split, and this is a, to me, this is a great question, and that's why I don't tie it to your actual um, correct answer. So the interesting thing is you look at this and you say, aha, so we've got this sort of split in the audience, okay? 53% uh, of you said Albany, New York, why? Right? So now you've got that, again, you've got that feeling of, well, I know that I am, you know, 162 people agreed with me, right, on this. So I will raise my hand and say why I want that, right? I don't know, can you guys tell me why? Why do you think half the people selected Albany? What's your sort of rationale for that? New York would be, in my opinion, too biased, or you know, ah, skewed. Okay. And they wouldn't get sort of a represent, representative answer. Okay, so New York doesn't represent the U.S. more right. like Albany does. Okay. Then you can ask the 47%, why did you say New York? New York. Right, I don't know, does anybody have a, a thought behind that? What do you it's think? much more diverse market, so uh -huh. I'm, not, I'm not sure of like, the SES or the like, racial breakdown of Albany. Yeah, so, so you might say, but it's way more diverse, right? It's not kind of like your cookie cutter, like suburban kind of a, right? So you have this discussion in class about that, and you start to say, well, 
then what really matters in making this decision, right? So then I can actually show them um, the list, right? And we can say, aha, see, it's not actually that obvious that number one is Albany and number 150 is New York, right? And so then we can talk about which factors turned out to be more important than others, because I would say that both of those responses are really rational, right? But you notice how if you're lecturing the students, if you just show them this information, they kind of, I mean, if, if I were just to show the students the information without the question, what do you think they would do? They would write it down. They'd memorize it, right? What else would they do? Would they say it's obvious? I mean, I, I think, I kind of felt like the first five years when I taught this material, they kind of look at that and go, oh, it's obvious. Yeah, because I'd show it to them and say, why? And they'd say, oh, well, because, you know, number one through five are really representative of the United States. And those other ones are, you know, very um, skewed. There's lots of Asian people in San Francisco, and, you know, whatever. So, so they get at this whole thing. And it seems, the answer seems totally obvious. Right? So I think that's kind of interesting because you're taking information that students would just kind of passively accept and say, oh, okay, I get that, and write it down, to something that really makes them go, oh, I never thought about that. You know, that's kind of interesting. So that's another type of question. Uh, should I keep going, or do you have no. more questions? Okay. Um, this is let's see. Than any question I can ask. <laughs> <laughs> So as another example, um, I have a whole lecture on the marketing research process. You go through and you talk about each of the boxes, right? And so I present them with a case scenario of coach handbags, and I won't do it here, but I tell them this story um, of how they sort of develop new products and the idea of um, sort of giving the scenario of sort of collecting the research and looking at different forces in the environment. I walk through them through this entire figure in class talking about how coach actually went out and had people observe and do focus groups and so on um, and sort of summarize some of the information, right? So I say, okay, so I'm demonstrating this idea of um, marketing research. Now what I used to do was I'd say, okay, now let's have a discussion question. Talk with your neighbor. Um, what should coach do next given this information? So I presented them the scenario, right? And I just asked them to discuss this. Okay. So, um, you know, I mean, so, so what do you think happens? So you're standing in front of 300 people, and you give them this, this. What do you think, like, as a faculty member standing down there at the bottom, what do you think I'm seeing? People checking their email and yeah. talking about something different. You're seeing a variety of things. <laughs> <laughs> so one is, I would say a good, like, eighth of the class doesn't. I mean, seriously. We've got some outstanding students, but we have some students who are just warm body sick. So you have some students who the first thing they do is they pull out their phone and so I had enough of that, right? Um, what else do you think you see as a faculty member standing down when you give them this discussion question? Maybe they talk two seconds and then they start to talk something else. Yeah. So people have this real problem with talking to their neighbor. They don't have a problem talking to a neighbor if it's somebody they know and they're catching up on their weekend during class or what have you. But for some reason, I have noticed a huge shift in this generation where talking to somebody you don't know is awful. Um, in fact, before I started Clickers, we had instituted this thing called the buddy system in class in which we try to get each student to know another student in class and get to know, you know and, and that only half worked. Right? So this kind of thing, you, what you'd see is you'd see a bunch of students just never talk to anybody and they just kind of like sit there. So you're going, are they thinking about this question or are they just sitting there? Right? So that you don't know. Then you see people who are just, you know, for two seconds, they kind of say, I don't know, what do you think? Oh, no, no. Yeah. And that's it. So then when it comes to question time, I say, okay, now you've discussed this. Tell me what you come back with. What happens? You might get a couple students who really did it and are not shy and raise their hands. But sometimes you just get 300 people kind of staring at you, right? So, you know, that, that was really hard, um, actually, in a really large class. And I'm sure even in a class of 30 or 40, 40, you get that sometimes, right? So instead, you convert it. So, you know, you do the same thing. You go through and you talk about the marketing research. But then I thought, okay, let me give them options here, okay? 
So rather than just have them talk about it, I'm going to give them concrete clicker question options. And, you know, sorry, I should have shown that. But, um, but like, even before you kind of say, well, now you've given them options and before you haven't, I've got to tell you, before I would try to even verbalize options to them, and they still weren't really getting it. So here, I make a clicker question, and I say, which recommendation would you make? Focus on the work bags because of whatever. Focus on the purses because of whatever. Focus on a combination because of whatever. So it doesn't matter what it says there, right? I give them three different options, and I say, weigh these up in a concrete manner, and then vote, okay? Now, there are different ways that you can do this. Um, and this is a trick that Brian taught me, which I thought is really clever. One thing you can do is you can have them do it on their own. So they read through this, and they kind of think to themselves, okay, I think A is the best option. So you have them all click in. And then you say, okay, we're not even going to look at those results. I want you to now talk to your neighbor. Okay? And then I want you to see if you came up with the same idea as your neighbor or a different idea as your neighbor. Talk about why and see if you can persuade each other to maybe answer what the other person answered, right, if it was different. And one thing I find is really fascinating about that is if you do a comparison between the talking to your neighbor and the doing it on your own individually, I would say in every single circumstance, when you talk to your neighbor, you get a better, more accurate response set, which I think is really strange and fascinating. Like, particularly when you do sample exam questions, you do the comparison of how did you know it on your own versus when you talk to somebody, it really shows that power of collaborative thinking, which I think is another neat thing to kind of demonstrate in the classroom. So, um, you know, so in this case, there isn't actually one perfect answer. And so you kind of see the spread, right, where people kind of came up with different things. And then I talk about each of these scenarios. Why did you say A versus B versus C? And you get people talking because now you see that 29% of the people said A also. Right? So we can kind of talk about A, and, and it's more legitimate as a response to raise your hand and say something about it. So I just think it's, it's very useful. Now, you know, what happened in this example is then I give them additional information, and I talk about how laptops back in 1990 um, are not these tiny little things that we're kind of used to, right? And they're, they're bigger, and you can ask people who went to school yeah, that you had to have, you know. And so how does that change things? And that's kind of fascinating because then you build on that information and you revote, right? And then you get more and more people saying, uh, <coughs> I wouldn't do number C, which is a combination because a catch-all bag would just be way too heavy or whatever. Yeah. So this is kind of fascinating. You can take just this one clicker question and you can ask like five questions around it by changing the scenario a little bit. Jennifer, yeah. do you see um, sort of camaraderie among the different groups too as they try to Depends. Yeah. Like yeah. You do. Um, I think what's kind of fun is when you start, and I don't have an example, but one of the things I could follow up with here is you then ask them to be a little bit creative. So, I mean, I'm lucky because I teach a marketing class. So people can be a little more creative. So a follow-up question I could ask would be something like, um, you know, what would you name? Like B is actually what Coach did. Um, they made these smaller little wristlet. That's what a wristlet is, like a tiny little bag that you put inside there. So, so then I sort of spill out, like this is actually what they did. Now, let's come up with a name for that. And we can't use wristlet because I've just said that. But um, you, let's come up with, and so, so what I might do is then I'd say, okay, I want you to talk to your neighbors and come up with a name for that. And it would just be a blank thing that says, and I'd even just type it on the screen, like, what is it called, right, A, B, C, D, E. And I get people telling me from the audience that I walk around and things. That takes, takes time, but that is one thing that generates a lot of camaraderie. So somebody might say, I think you should call it the mini purse, and I think you should. And it's so neat because people start defending their answers, or somebody will say, hey, I like what that person said. Um, and, and so, yeah, in a class of 300, suddenly it feels like you've got 30 people there. And so that's one thing that makes a big difference is that everybody is now working on the same problem. And I started doing that a lot. Is this like open-ended? Okay, let's just ask this as an open-ended question. You guys fill in A, B, C, D, and E for me, and then we'll vote and see which one we like the best. Yes. One thing I've noticed along these lines, but where you it's very creative. So I have the same thing. If I say talk with your neighbors, yeah, forms not configured for them to talk to their neighbors. Yeah. I know. But what, what, I, what I will sometimes do is put up a question, and if the modal answer is incorrect. 
Uh -huh. I'll say you're wrong. So talk to your neighbors about the correct it. Uh -huh. Actually, they'll really start buzzing uh -huh. know, because there's some sort of, I don't know exactly what it is, but there's something else introduced into it that yeah. creates an energy that's not there otherwise. And then if they get it wrong again, they get even more energized as the choice is cut down from five to four to three. See. And, yeah. and I, I find that gets them talking in a way that I never can if I just say talk to the neighbor. See, I, I, I think that's a really good point. And it reminds me actually of the keynote and the idea of it almost becomes a little bit of a game for them. Yeah. Right? Where it's, I want to get it right. And I want to figure out why it's right. And I want to maximize my points, even though I don't keep points. I just I count how many times you click in. But I think there's a sense of pride there of if I got it right, then I feel better about myself in some way. Yeah, I find another way to generate that game is if you put the histogram live while they're answering the question and you see the sort of herd reaction, you know, yeah. or the follow whatever answer is. And so that will often take you to the incorrect answer. Yeah. Because they've just been following one another and they're I've never done that, but that's interesting. So you yeah. actually show show it going up right, as you people answer, that's cool. So then they start to get keyed up. Uh -huh. uh, and it's that energy, I think, that that, that game aspect grows into it. Well, yeah. That we just learned that. <laughs> and, it, and it's totally dynamic because what happens, and I don't have this shown, but what happens is on the screen, they are seeing how many people have clicked in. Right. With that and so there's this dynamic thing going on there. Like, wow, 200 people have already answered this question. I better get moving. You know? <coughs> and it does become a little bit like, if you're watching QVC or something, you know, it is, it is like a game, right, where you're seeing this kind of happen. And I'll even make jokes with them. I'll say, look, last time we had, you know, 312 of you, you know, where are 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12? Where are you guys? You know, um, because you guys are stalling us. So if you make it a little bit more, it becomes more conversational, I think, in some ways. Um, Jennifer, I was in this class when you were doing yeah, this remember, example. Yeah. And my, the, the funniest part was there were, like, three guys behind me. And they were arguing about, like, listen, if I was a girl, I would want this person. Yes. And it was just this, like, this crazy conversation that, I, yeah. I mean, I just got to overhear that was just, was ridiculous. I would want one bag for everything. Why would I want five bags? That's the yeah. same. It was just, I don't imagine them talking about women's purses just outside of your class. And, and I so. think, yeah, I think it's also they need a crutch. It's like they need a talking point. It's mm -hmm. almost like that. You know, if you go to somebody's house and you don't know them and everybody feels very uncomfortable and you sit down around the coffee table and there's something interesting to look at, like, you know, like, oh, well, that's an interesting centerpiece. You know, it becomes like that conversation starter where all of a sudden people feel like they can talk to each other a little bit more. I had this one thing happen in my, in a different section where um, we were doing an open-ended question, and, and I asked them to come up with an example of, I don't know, slice of life advertising or something like that. And so I was sort of putting their examples A through E, you know, just typing them in as people were telling me. And this one guy, um, I went up to him and I said, do you have an example? And he told me, so I started typing it in, but then he raised his hand and he said, no, I'm gonna delete it, I don't, I don't want it on there. So I said, okay, so I deleted it. Well, the funny thing, so instead of A through E, I deleted E, so I had A through D. And so I had the students vote, and I noticed that two, two students voted for E, right? And so I said, oh, well, I guess two of you weren't paying attention because we deleted E. But these kids raised their hand, and they said, actually, I really liked what you, were, what you typed on that board, and I wish you hadn't deleted it. And so you get this kind of like, you know, so that student felt good. It was like, oh, my idea actually was pretty good, and I felt embarrassed. But so there's a lot of interesting kind of social stuff that happens on the sidelines as a result of using these clickers. Um, so it's really it's kind of fun. Um, so let me, I think I had one more thing. Okay, so a lot of impromptu clicker use kind of emerges as you start getting traction on using these clickers. Um, so, for example, I, I show them this, this video when I'm talking about contact methods and interview um, and I say you know one of the things you know there are pros to interviewing people and there are cons and one of them is highly subject to interviewer bias okay and I used to just show them this video which sort of shows this idea of diamond shreddies and new and exciting uh, sorry versus old shreddies which are actually the exact same product so, so, so. so I'd show them this and we talk about how, why is it in these interviews you got interviewer bias? 
Okay? Because what they demonstrate in these videos is people are saying, oh yeah, I really like that one, you know, the one on the right. It, and well, they can do stuff like they put it out and they say, you know, try, try the one on the right versus the one on the left. What happens? Do people think they're the same? No. no. It's totally fascinating. So you get people, you know, in these interviews, like going, oh yeah, I think the diamond shaped one is crunchier. <coughs> and you know, start doing all these things that are kind of baffling. So I used to talk about this purely as an example of highly subject to interviewer bias. This idea that we want to please people or we can sort of psychologically believe there's a difference, because there must be. That person has told us there's a difference between them, right? Last time when I was teaching this, I kind of thought, well, let me actually see if it really is just interviewer bias. So, oh, I guess I should set it up. So I asked them the question, I just said, you know, I'm gonna ask you a clicker question before we watch the video. Look at the one on the left. Look at the one on the right. Do you think that you prefer A, the one on the left, B, the one on the right, or C, you prefer, prefer them equally? Right? Um, and so then I had them key in. And it was kind of fascinating. Right, because what are these results showing us? Is it that 50% of the people are saying? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sort of, right? 50% of the people are saying, I get that they're exactly the same. But what if you get people, but that means 50% of the people actually are already sort of pre-biased, you know, even before you go into an interview situation. So then we kind of talk about the psychology of it. And why is it that when somebody tells you something is old and boring, you tend to believe them, although 10% of you didn't, apparently. 40% um, of the people clearly were kind of swayed by it. So we had sort of this sidebar conversation about sort of the psychology of it, and why people would pick the one on the right over the one on the left, in addition to the interviewer bias. Right? Um, one thing I didn't mention, is that you can also use demographics. And I don't know if you guys have done this at all, who have used clickers. That is totally fascinating. At the beginning of the semester, you can ask them to click in with their own clicker. Um, you know, gender, um, I know, year in school, ethnicity, religion, whatever you want to find out. Are you, I have a question that's, are you from Pittsburgh or Philadelphia or neither, right? So stuff that might be kind of relevant. And then you can look at this data, and you can actually then divided based on demographics, right? So you might find that, I don't know, if I had a, a thing that measured like people who eat cereal all the time versus never eat cereal. You know, it might be that there's a skewing in terms of who said the 50%, right? So that's kind of neat, you can kind of do these comparisons. Yeah. So the clicker data retains like all this information throughout the class? Yeah, I mean, it's supposed to, right? I sometimes yeah. had to retake it. Really? Because I wasn't, I, I would actually retake the information because they were slightly different students in the class. Um, but apparently it's supposed to retain it from the beginning of the semester. But they, they quite liked redoing it anyway because I would ask them different questions sometimes. Yeah. So like, for example, I had this really cool one. It was on peanut butter. So I asked the question, um, do, do you eat peanut butter? Like yes or no? And then it was something like, do you prefer crunchy, um, creamy, or like natural or something like that? And so I could ask the students this information and then we compared it with national data in terms of how the students fare versus like the national data. Um, and then we parsed it based on ethnicity. And it was really interesting because Asian people don't eat peanut butter, apparently. And Asian people also, when they eat peanut butter, it's like only crunchy. I can't remember, it was something like that, right? And so then we started talking about, you know, that I showed them the data and say, what do you make of this if you're a brand manager for Jif, right? So we had this whole conversation about you know, trying to figure out why Asian people don't eat peanut butter. Are there ways you can incorporate it into the diet that aren't your standard peanut butter and jelly? You know, so, you know, you can get all this really cool information by just, you know, using that demographic data, too. Um, one of the other impromptu things, I don't have the example on here um, that I did was, one time I was showing them consumer behavior. And I was saying there are ads that are meant to be about the culture, and there are ads that are meant to be about the subculture. Okay? And I would say, um, and in my old version of the class, I would say, let me show you an ad that's about culture, and it's a Budweiser commercial. Okay? And it's one of those Super Bowl commercials, it has the Clydesdales, it has a guy who looks like a cowboy, he's throwing a stick to his dog, it looks very kind of American in tone, it's not a truck, you know, all these things. So that was my classic example of 
culture. Okay? Then I'd show an example of subculture, a Bud Light commercial, and we like women and men in a party and how they're different. Okay? And those were my standard examples for five years. But this year, what I did was I said, okay, I'm going to show you these two commercials, and I want you to tell me if the first one is an example of culture or subculture, and if the second one is an example of culture or subculture. Just thinking, this is an easy question to get. Okay? I was totally floored. The first one I showed them the Budweiser commercial with the Clydesdale, with the dog, and the man who looked like a cowboy. I had 50% of the students say it was an example of subculture. And 50% say it was an example of culture. And I said, what? Why did you answer subculture? Can you think of what some of the students said? Only old people drink Budweiser. <laughs> okay, so part of it might be their own sort of biases who the target market is already. Okay, there might have been some of that. Can you think of other examples? I'm not a cowboy and I'm driving a truck. Yeah, yeah. I had, and I will remember in both of my sections, I had <coughs> a minority student, in one class it was a her, in one case it was a guy, raise their hand and say, you know what, that is somebody's culture, but that's not my culture. I see that as a distinct subculture of America. And I thought, wow, five years, I've been telling people this is an example of culture, but the average consumer is interpreting it as subculture. Right? So there's just stuff like that where I thought, wow, I am learning so much by using <coughs> these words. I, I couldn't believe it. I just thought, wow, I've been wrong. Well, I haven't been wrong. 50% of the people agree with me, right? <laughs> but clearly, 50% 50 50 of the class, and we're just kind of like, OK, I'll take notes on that. It's an example of culture. I don't believe you know, they kind of realize, oh, yeah, it, could, it might not be culture to some people, right? It might actually be viewed as somebody else's subculture. So, you know, I just thought that was um, fascinating. We have a couple minutes. Okay. Before we I think those were all the slides I had. Uh, right, yeah. Anybody has any questions, I'll give you a button with a question mark on it if you ask a question. Okay. I think most people will get buttons if they're interested, because everybody has some good questions. Um, do you use this as a uh, purpose for a great I was thinking 10% of great stuff from the, if they do yeah. like that. Uh, I can't remember what percentage. Do you remember what percentage? I, I did what I recommended. Um, it was like 5% maybe, and but there was a lot of leniency. So I didn't count clicker points at all before the ad drop period, right, because you can't. Um, and then after that point, I think there were 24 classes, and they could miss four of them and still get the full credit. Because what happens is you end up with students coming up to you and telling you, my clicker died on me halfway through the session. And I'm pretty lenient also on how it's calculated during the session. They only have to, I don't tell them this, but they only have to answer 50% of the questions to get credit for that day. I don't tell them that, but that, that's how it's done so that we don't have to worry about all the students going, I missed, I came in a little late and I missed the first two questions. Should be okay. We'll look into it. You know, that kind of thing. So then I had 20 questions. I think as long as you, you came to 20 of the sessions and partic I, I, I label it as participation, it's not attendance. Right? Um, as long as you come to 20 of them, then you get the full 5%. And I think it's for every two that they missed. Then it was, you know, they were docked half a percent or something. Yeah. And the device would keep track of all that for you? It just it all goes into the system. So I would put a jump drive <coughs> in at the end copy it over. Is that how we do it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and then I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> and then you put it on, that's right, and then you go back to your office and you stick it on there. And it's just, it's all there. It's so fascinating. Yeah. It's like, no more scantrons, no more walking down to UTS, you know, it's great. Can you put that in the English somehow? Is that, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so your, your colleague, Franklin Carter, yeah. was doing scantrons, I think, twice a week. And he had like 500 scantrons twice a week that he would take to the testing service center yeah. upstairs for me. And uh, yeah. they said, like, Franklin, we miss you. Where have you been? <laughs> because uh, he would take like 20,000 scantrons a semester there, and now he, he didn't take any. So much paper. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, mean, I would have my students, when we did scantrons, they're bubbling in two bubbles at the most. You know? And it, yeah. um, with the demographics, so if, it, so if you ask a bunch of demographic questions, it will remember the demographics tied to that person's clicker. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. 
It's so interesting, and it's all FERPA yeah, it's, approved it, and things. There's separate places, and it's it's not tracked by your name or your user ID or anything like that. It's by the clicker. Numbers. But it'll do, it will keep track of. Oh, yeah. Um, this is what you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Asian students thought. This yeah. Is wow. And and I would ask sometimes I would just ask the class. So we would do something, and I would say, oh, let's divide this by a demographic. Some demo What do you think would be interesting to know about? Right? If people have a political affiliation or something like that, right? And then I take that data and then we look at it to see if there was a difference in like peanut butter usage and political affiliation. You know, <laughs> just stuff like that. It was really kind of cool. Yeah. I think so. yeah. But that demographic data isn't like, you couldn't like pull it up and say student X is. No. Okay. No. Because they're all n just numbers. There's no clear type. Yeah, and we would all go to jail. If yeah. That was <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah. So I don't think nothing about clicker technology. I'm completely new to like Penn State and everything. And how do you, so like are the questions that you ask, because you're talking about you can like ask an impromptu question that's yeah. going to type the PowerPoint. So like are the questions that you ask, like when you go out and look at the data, like are they tied to, like you just made an Instagram that says like A, B, and C, or and do you have to like remember, okay, this went with question one, which was about what coach should do next, and this one question, or is it actually like somehow tied to the question? And how does that work if you decide to like impromptu ask a question de novo? So if you, um, it just collects all this information, and you can, like one thing I do is I go back and look at the images, so you can actually go to a file which shows you the actual slide of the question, <coughs> and then you go to the matching number of that slide, and it shows you what the response set looked like for that particular class. So in the, in the grading software, um, once you stop a question, it takes a screenshot of whatever's on your screen. So typically you'll have it's a PowerPoint up. It'll take a, a, a shot of that question. Mm -hmm. If you're doing something on the fly, it's going to take a screenshot of whatever's on your screen. So. Yeah. Um, most, I think most instructors that, that I get to work with that do a lot of those questions always have a little pad and paper by their podium. Okay. So if they ask a question, they'll just jot it down. And for the most part, I think, when you're asking those follow-up questions, it's more for discussion. So a lot of folks don't even count them. They just get rid of them. Right. So. Yeah. Have you heard any feedback from the students in terms of their... You know, a lot of them, I, I, I had students who would come up to me during office hours, I in office hours, and, and just say things like, oh, I love these clickers. I feel like I'm learning so much more. Um, it's funny, I think maybe it was a couple weeks ago I was in the elevator, and there was a student who was in my Marketing 301 class, and she just introduced herself, because you know, there's a lot of students, and so I don't think I had met her one-on-one -on -one before. And so we were just sort of chatting, and she said, oh, that was so cool how you use those clickers in class. Yeah. Like, completely unprompted. There's no reason for her to tell me that information, but, but it is, yeah, it's really neat. I, I think the students got a lot out of it. I think they, what could be potentially boring lecture material, you know, ends up being much more engaging. Um, I sometimes felt like the students started waiting for the next clicker question. Like, you know, okay, get through the next six slides. <laughs> you know, I kind of want to be able to participate now. I, I really felt that. Um, and I think, to give you a little bit more of my background, I know we're out of time, aren't we? No. But to give you a little more of my sort of background, when I first teach, started teaching the really large intro class, it, class, I was used to only teaching small classes and like 40 students. Um, so this to me was kind of a weird, terrifying proposition. And I would start calling on students in the forum, and those students hated me as a result of that <laughs> because I just thought, well, this is what you do when you're teaching a class. Right? You say, so what's your, what do you think is the answer? You know, and people are like, you know, and then they all kind of look at you like, why did you call on me? You know? um, and so I had sort of a, a lot to learn, I think, in teaching a large class. And so I think whether this is your first time teaching a large class or your, te you know, 10th semester, um, it just makes a big difference in, I, I mean, I can't, uh, you know, you should be paying me really for this, but <laughs> the university should be paying yeah, for this. Yeah, not me. It's three dollars in my wallet. <laughs> oh, okay. um, but it just makes, to me, it's made such a big difference in the classroom, and my, my like, joy of teaching in the classroom, too. How have you changed? Have you, have you totally PowerPoint talked the whole time when you've driven, or I mean, have you gone from yeah. 50% interactive, engaging? Um, I'm a pacer, so <laughs> in my class, I walk around the classroom, it was PowerPoint, it was lecture, I would ask questions and wait for people to answer. 
I try to talk to your neighbor and tell me something. So I tried to make it somewhat interactive. I would have in-class activities for which we took the scantrons. So I tried to make it interactive, but the problem with that method was that you didn't get, you still didn't get as much engagement as you want. Um, I don't think the students ever felt that comfortable. They felt like they were just like doing this, I gotta fill out the scantron today. Um, and, it, it, and it wasn't that kind of like relationship. Like I feel like with the, click, with the clickers, there's a relationship you develop with your class because it's so frequent and so um, like changeable and so on the fly. It's not like when I did in-class activities, I knew, oh, Tuesday's going to be an activities day. Let's bring the scantrons. And let me make sure that my, my PowerPoint says the exact thing I want them to do, right? Whereas this is way more just, okay, let's just do this now. And so there's less at stake for each question. Now. The clicker questions? I have maybe five questions per lecture. And it was an hour and 15 minute lecture. And sometimes the questions would result in discussion. Okay, so. That's one thing you have to monitor, though, because then it becomes more of a discussion. And if you're trying to move things along, you've got to really manage that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a question in the back? Well, I just wondered if you ever used the examination, like a, like a I have So I still kind of make sure that I have the idea behind it before making 